This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is General Norton A. Schwartz, who was the 19th Air Force Chief of Staff. And he is on the Berkeley campus uh, to deliver the 2013 Fleet Admiral Chester Nimitz Lecture. Uh, General Schwartz, welcome to Berkeley. Thank you so much. Where were you born and raised? small town in South Jersey uh, called Tom's River. For, for those from the East Coast, they know it as Exit 81. Uh -huh. and, uh, and grew up there. It was a small farming community and uh, a good place to grow up. And looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? I, I think there was a, um, a fundamental interest in public service. My dad uh, owned a small typewriter repair shop in town, but served on a number of community boards and things of that nature. And so I think that that was the that start, uh, the seed, which was that public service was both worthy and uh, rewarding work. And, and around the dinner table, was there discussion of, of uh, world events? Oh, certainly. I mean, I remember the black and white TV, you know, which was quite a development, uh, used to watch the news. He sat in his lounger chair and we sat with him, you know, to, to watch the news. So yes, we were learned early on to, uh, to pay attention to current events. Did, did you decide to go into the military early in your life or, or did you have other interests uh, like international affairs or, or whatever? C certainly did. Um, but my primary interest in, uh, turned out to be in aviation. For some reason, I had a, uh, a, an interest in airplanes and things of that nature. I remember riding my bicycle down to the grass strip, which was known in those days as the Ocean County Airport. And, um, and as a result of that interest, uh, my older brother was in school at the time uh, in New York. And we couldn't quite swing having both of us in school at the same time. So counselor recommended perhaps applying to one of the military academies. Um, I could fly, it would be a scholarship and so on, and, and the rest is sort of history. And, and this is a, another example of the extraordinary opportunity and upward mobility that, that the military has offered to many generations well, now. Well, certainly uh, true in this case. Um, you know, again, we were not a well-to-do family. My dad wasn't a senator or, or a doctor, or attorney, judge, what have you. And that, you know, a uh, young fella could choose to serve and, and with uh, hard work and a, and a good deal of good fortune, you know, it's uh, quite amazing what can happen. And it would only happen in the United States. It wouldn't happen in the European militaries or the Asian militaries, you know, sort of only in America. Uh, at the military academy, what, what sort of subjects did you take? Uh, did, did you get a, a broad spectrum of thinking? Well, the, the curriculum at the Air Force Academy is broad. There's a core curriculum which, involve, which, is, which is heavily into the sciences and engineering, but, but likewise, uh, you know, philosophy and English and so on. I started out as an aeronautical engineering major to consistent with my interest in aviation. And uh, in my sophomore year, first semester, I sort of got hung up in thermodynamics. Hmm. Uh, it was it was uh, not easy, and uh, I ultimately uh, went off into the international affairs and political science track, uh, which is what I graduated with. And and, and uh, you know both things are important. Both the the engineering disciplines, which which help people focus on problem solving skills, 
as well as the, the, the more liberal arts things which help critical thinking. It's, uh, it's a great combination. And, and how soon do you get into a plane, which I guess is what you wanted? Sure. Uh, I went off to pilot training after graduating from the Air Force Academy in Del Rio, Texas. At the time, um, there was only a Pizza Hut and a Whataburger in Del Rio. Uh, didn't have even a McDonald's back then. Um, but, but that was, uh, you spent a year in pilot training uh, in 1974 and 75, and then went off on the first assignment to the Philippines in the C-130 transport aircraft. And, and you, know, you did you do service in Vietnam? Was that... On the back end of Vietnam, we were, I was assigned to the, to the airlift wing at Clark Air Base in the Philippines and, and uh, made multiple trips to, to Thailand, to Benoit, Tan Sanud, and so on uh, in, in the region. Um, and then, of course, it, it, when time came in 1975, the evacuation of Saigon occurred, and we were actively involved in that. And, and did that experience of, of the evacuation, did that uh, uh, affect your thinking about the world and, and uh, wanting a, a strong military? I think that, um, y you know, the Vietnam experience was a difficult one, uh, and, and actually, you know, it had been a divisive issue in the country. Um, it had, you know, uh, divided families. It, it made it was a difficult period, and so the the end, the conclusion of of U.S. involvement there, you know, was was when I came on active duty was already a foregone conclusion. But it was doing it properly, it was making sure that it was done as best we could. And, you know, I remember vividly uh, carrying uh, hundreds of refugees out of Vietnam to Guam. And that, that was a searing memory, um, you know, of how desperate people were to seek our protection. Uh, I, I like to ask my guests what skills uh, uh, and temperament are involved in in what they do, and so so first, let's talk about you as a as a pilot, mm -hmm. and and students watching this program. What what are your thoughts about the skills they they should be gaining, but also their temperament, the kind of character uh, as a pilot, and then we'll talk about leadership. Sure, I think that um, the, the the amazing thing about aviation is, to put it simply is that if you're not on airspeed, altitude, and heading, you get immediate feedback, and you know exactly who's at fault. Unlike so many other things in life, which are much more ambiguous, the, the marvelous thing about aviation is that, is that you get immediate feedback, and if you're good, you can see it right away, and if you're not, you get that as well. And so uh, I, I enjoyed that aspect of, of trying to become an accomplished aviator, which requires precision and focus and the ability to, to uh, deal with crises and contingencies that may arise because other lives are at stake and, uh, and to do that in a professional way. And so I think that, that aviation affected my professional demeanor more than almost anything else. That was a certain calm, dispassionate ability to, to assess a situation, come to a judgment in, in rapid order, and then deal with it in as thorough and deliberate a way as possible. That, that's the secret of staying alive in aviation. Are, are you born to fly? Or are you shaped even before you, you go into the service to be able to do that? I think there are two parts to aviation. One is natural skill. And I was not a natural pilot. Uh, you know, if I, I was a decent pilot, don't misunderstand, but, um, but certainly not as gifted as some. And there is a gift uh, that's associated with this. But, but there is also a mindset, uh, a, you know, an ability to, to integrate multiple inputs in real time in, in a pressure situation that some people 
are better able to accommodate than others, and some of that can be learned. Uh, and so, as opposed to the the aspect of natural skill, and uh, and so um, I fell more into the latter category than than the particularly gifted former category. We're 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 moving in a transition to new kinds of aircraft. Sure. We'll talk about that in in the Lua, but just as a pilot, do, do you see differences uh, in, uh, between? Uh, what it takes to be a pilot in an actual aircraft versus to be one in a, in a, ro a remotely controlled uh, well, I think craft. that the transition that has occurred in the years that I've been flying for 40 years or so is that the, the machines have become much more reliable and much more automated. And so in the early days when, when aviators would, would hand fly and navigate and do all those things sort of mechanically themselves with some aids but 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 very little automation uh, these days uh, you know airplanes fly themselves pretty well provided they're monitored and and there's the ability to intervene if something goes wrong and so I think the that that is the major shift is is the the advance of computer technology and the ability to automate many of the functions that that required uh, you know engagement by by the aviator uh, him, himself or herself. I think that uh, the one thing that has not changed, and this is important again, is is that ability to to assess the environment and determine that that something isn't quite right in the machine in, in, the, in, in, the, in the machine or in the automation that currently exists um, you know there are glitches they happen all the time and the question is um, you know as someone once said you want to make sure that your takeoffs equal your landings and and being a conscious observer of events in the cockpit and outside the cockpit and making sure again that that the machine is acting as it should or that you intervene to to make it act properly is is sort of the nature of aviation today as a layman i think of a pilot in a plane as as somebody who identifies with the craft in the way that a car owner might, you know, who, who's yeah. really wedded to his vehicle and so on. Is, is that fair? I, I think that's an excellent point. Um, certainly, you know, I have great affection for the machines that I've flown. And in fact, um, you will find that people become attached to certain specific aircraft. In fact, my final flight as an Air Force officer was aboard a special operations C-130 tail number 0568 <laughs> and uh, which will be retired here in another couple of months but uh, the, 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 the neat thing was we, I had some history in that airplane we'd been to interesting places and so yes you definitely have a, uh, a relationship and a, and a you know affection for these machines that keep you out of harm's way Let's talk about uh, leadership in the military. You, you've had some very important commands in addition to your most recent role. You were head of U.S. Transportation Command, uh, head of U.S. Special Operations Command in the Pacific. What, what are the skills involved in, in leadership and, and how do they evolve over time? I think that the, the key thing is trust. And engendering trust both in those who work for you and those with whom you work and for whom you work is, is, a, is the essential commodity. It's, without it, uh, one can not be as successful as, as you need to be. Uh, the other aspect of leadership is, again, dealing with the, the unplanned events. Um, I think these things these occur in any walk of life and and those who are the most successful are the ones who can rally their team and and deal with that in a way that you know 
takes care of the, the issue, but doesn't lose sight of what the longer term objective is. Um, that's the that's key. So trust, the ability to deal with crisis, and uh, you know, a decision process that is somewhat repeatable. People, in my uh, experience, will prefer those who make decisions in a methodical way maybe quickly in some cases and less quickly in others, but that there is, that there is a, a recognizable process involved with making choices. And that is another skill set, I think, that, that is uh, very handy in any leader. You, you've been involved in a number of commands and situations where circumstances really change, where the mission changes, where there's new technology and, and so on. Sure. So, so that's another ball you've got to keep in the air. And, and how, how does that change things? If, if you are the leader at, at, at any level, if you are a leader of an organization, uh, that it, the organizations change over time and missions change, you have to adapt. And so adaptability is another one of those key qualities that enables uh, a leader of an organization to see how the landscape is changing, how to keep their organization relevant. And that, that relevance has a little different meaning in, say, business versus the armed forces. But, but uh, relevance matters. And, and then how, again, to negotiate the path to that that sustained relevancy. And, uh, and again, people will rally around folks who have that vision and have a plan and also have the, the, uh, the courage of their convictions. And, and how do you communicate that to, to the, the personnel under you, your immediate staff, but that beyond that? I, I think there's an, a number of ways to do that. Some of it's personal, one-on-one. -on -one. Some of it is through documentation that, that sort of elaborates on what the organizational vision is. Um, and, and clearly, you know, there's a need to get out and, and you know, walk the talk. Uh, that, that is so true, and, and I found that to be very handy. In fact, um, there's an old saying about that one of the best means of managing is walking. So, you know, management by walking is, is a, uh, is, it, I have found to be very useful. Well, let's take an example of, of one of the commands that you've had it, it, as, as chief of staff. You've had to deal with, with the nuclear command. Uh, and and there you come in and and there had been some mishaps uh, a loss of morale I, I think uh, there were two incidents one where planes were flown across the country with nuclear tip devices another where some I guess fuses were sent by mistake to to an ally and so on so so apply what you said about leadership to that because you were presented with the choice of reorganization right. of maintaining morale and, and where is all of this done what does the command look like under you the the, the issue that confronted us was dealing with the most most lethal weapons in in the department of defense inventory and because of the fights at the time in, in iraq and afghanistan there was an understandable uh, emphasis on the activity that was occurring there. I mean, that's, that, was, that was today's job. The dilemma was is that there are some ongoing requirements in any organization that require attention, and for us, none more pressing than the proper stewardship of the nation's nuclear weapons. And we had, as you indicated, we had, we had some significant uh, deviations from standard there. It resulted in the, in the dismissal of my predecessor and the civilian secretary of the Air Force. This was serious stuff. And so when we came in, Secretary Mike Donnelly and I came into the jobs in 2008, the mission was to remedy that that problem in, in the, what we call the nuclear enterprise. And so we went about it in a systematic way. One was to reemphasize standards. One was 
regrettably was moving some people on who hadn't met expectations. Uh, another was uh, organizing in a way that, that assured that the institution could maintain its focus in this mission area, which had diffused after the demise of the Cold War and so on. So it, it was multifaceted. Uh, but fundamentally, this was a question of emphasizing standards and discipline and the importance of the mission and the rigor with which the American people expected us to perform. And so we worked hard and, and you know, again, you never say never. Um, mistakes will occur uh, because we are all human. But but the, the thing was, mistakes that big, uh, I'm confident, are, are no longer in the cards because of the scrutiny, the professionalism, and, and the rigor with which that organization, which focuses on nuclear business now, does its work. And, and what, what, are, what is the problem or dilemma posed by the fact that, you know, there, there's much talk in the air, even among former elites in the national security, of moving toward zero, basically, on the one hand? And, and so the, the, it, sure. it seems like a continuing morale problem. What you're doing is important, even though, you know, the mission is, is becoming more focused and narrow. Well, I think that... Um you will, would not find anyone in the nuclear business doing that work who philosophically would deny the, the potential long-term objective of, you know, eliminating nuclear weapons across the planet. I mean, uh, that, that, that is a valid long-term goal. The question is, can it be achieved in the near term? And, and in the interim, our standard of performance cannot weaken. And so, you know, our message was, and, and it remains today, that as long as, as America requires its armed forces to maintain the nuclear deterrent posture we have, or something like it, that we're going to do it with, with the professionalism uh, and, and the precision and the reliability that, that is properly expected of us. And, and so I think that's the motivation. Uh, it's it, clearly, um, you know, there's anxiety about what the future may hold, but that is a, a fundamental cause for leadership, which is despite the anxiety, which we all share to some degree, greater or less, that, that we must focus on our jobs and do them right, and, and as a result, there will be opportunity for the nation's leaders to make these choices without the distraction of concern whether the weapons are secure, safe, and reliable. Uh, one, one of the issues that facing the country, and I'm sure the military, is, well, who is the adversary now, as, you know, with the fall of the Soviet Union many years ago and so on? And, and under your domain has been the whole problem of, of the cyber threat mm -hmm. and, and uh, uh, the, the um, mobilizing to deal with that threat. Let, let's talk a, a little about that because it's, you know, uh, you're always striving control, for control of a domain, but the, the question becomes, well, hey, what is the threat here? So, so help us understand the implications sure. of cyber for both offense and defense in, in warfare first. Sure. Well, I think, first of all, um, you know, striving to exercise complete control of domains is, is uh, you know, is an objective that's probably unachievable, particularly as technology has uh, proliferated as, as it has in, in the last hundred years or so. I think that cyber it, it is is a capability that is fundamental to military activity, to business, to medicine, to any profession right now. And that is because the data systems that we depend on, the decision support systems that we depend on, the aircraft themselves are software-based these days. 
and that, and that there are ways to tinker with those control systems uh, that, that, that could be harmful if they're not properly dealt with. And that, that is the fundamental threat that's associated with cyber, either altering control systems in a way that, that increases hazard to the operator or to broader populations, or uh, making data which is very important for decision making, uh, somehow altering that data in a way that, that might produce poor decision making. So, fundamentally, uh, th this is a question of technology, and, and another important point is that unlike things that required wealthy nations to field in the past, aircraft is a case in point, particularly high-performance aircraft, the barriers to entry for cyber are so much lower. It doesn't require large resources, it doesn't require state sponsorship, it just requires a connection and, you know, a, a certain attitude. And as a result, um, you know, we have seen this spread far and wide and it is a bit worrisome. I, would, I, I, I do not personally believe that it is a cataclysmic threat at the moment, but uh, that from a national security standpoint, but from an economic standpoint, I would argue that, that there are nations, including China, as has been recently reported, that have been ex exfiltrating terabytes of, of commercial information, of intellectual property, if you will, uh, that, that are extremely valuable to us as a nation, and, and that we must deal with, too. Mm -hmm. in, in a, in, I'm curious, in a battle situation, uh, uh, let's take Libya, for example, that at a certain point you could uh, develop a, a, a cyber capacity on our side so that you could uh, reduce the danger to pilots who previously would have right. to go in and, and take out sites and so on by right. immobilizing I, the software. Yeah. Well, I think just to simply put it, I mean, you could have a surface-to-air missile site, which you can uh, eliminate via a kinetic act like, uh, you know, delivering a, a weapon on it, an explosive device, or, you know, it's conceivable that you can uh, disable that, that uh, surface-to-air missile site with electrons. And so, uh, you know, and you might choose to do it one way in one situation and, and another, you know, in another. So I think the key thing is that there is a military role for both offensive and defensive cyber applications. Um, and, I, you know, the Air Force has, has tried to avail itself of of these uh, in, in this area on those things for which it's responsible. Uh, and that is, as you suggest, is primarily, uh, you know, air warfare in its, all its dimensions. Uh, you, you mentioned that in the case of cyber warfare that it, it could be an individual hacker mm -hmm. or a, a criminal gang, you know, as opposed to a state. And, and what, what is your thinking on uh, how we have to think about well, do we really want to do X, uh, least it uh, lead to a situation where adversaries, potential adversaries, even individuals, uh, adopt uh, and embrace that, uh, that strategy? Well, uh, you know, it depends, again, on, on uh, whether things are done in the open or whether they're done in a more, uh, you know, less visible manner. Um, I, I think that fundamentally, uh, you know, we need to be prepared, which, which suggests that we need both offensive and defensive capabilities. And, and we should be discriminating in how we use them, uh, without a doubt, because, the, you know, a moral example is important. I wouldn't say it's the only thing that's important, but, but you know, acting responsibly in the international uh, realm is is you know has significance. Uh, 
Um, at the same time, I, I also believe that, uh, and I think you would agree, that the intelligence business has been with us for a long time, and that espionage in all of its dimensions, you know, certainly uh, I, I see no, have no expectation that that will become passe. And as a result, you know, this is an area where, you know, we should also maintain a very robust capability. Uh, another uh, major transformation which you've been involved with in and, and which, you know, w with the filibuster the other day uh, has, has, is sort of coming into public discussion is the whole issue of using pilotless air aircraft mm -hmm. and so on. And uh, it, it raises uh, a, a real challenge on a on a whole series of of uh, dimensions. So so let's talk a little about that because I think I saw a quote from you that that in ten years, uh, eighty five percent was it or eighty percent of uh, 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 our vehicles will be pilotless. Basically, uh, I, I may be overstating what you right. said, but you can right. explain that. Yeah. Sure. Sure. I think that. Again, this is an area where technology is is taking us, um, and I guess the best way to sort of describe this is that when when the technology first came to the fore, uh, actually, it, the first remotely piloted aircraft were flown in the '60s. Um, primarily for strategic air command, both for reconnaissance purposes and for stimulating air defenses for the Chinese and, and the Soviet Union at the time. And of course, it has advanced now, and the two major things that have made it different from those earlier days is the fact that we have global navigation capability now, so these machines know where they're at all the time and global communications so that you do not have to be within direct line of sight of the, of the remotely piloted aircraft in order to communicate with it and control it. So these two developments have, have produced the uh, generation of aircraft that we use today, Predators, Reapers, Global Hawks, and so on. And they are uh, they bring two fundamental things to the battlefield. One is persistence, the ability to surveil an area for hours, even days. And the other is, uh, again, this, this capacity of reducing the footprint, the military footprint, in the forward areas because they can be operated remotely. Um, we've used that to good effect. Some would argue, and you know, uh, I, again, these are worthy debates, that, that somehow use of remotely piloted aircraft is unfair, it's immoral, uh, it's not chivalrous. But I would only conclude by, by saying that, that, that the history of battle is, is important here. It started with the bow, and it went to the longbow, and it went to the crossbow, and then it went to the rifle, and then it became field artillery, and then it was aircraft, and then it was missile, and all through the centuries, we have been working to extend the distance between combatants. Why? Because we want to reduce the risk to our personnel and amplify the risk to the enemy. I don't see this phenomenon diminishing. And certainly, in the area of remote, le remote aircraft, remote operations, and cyber, this is a continuation of that centuries-long trend. Now, uh, I, I guess what I'm interested in, uh, in, in the public debate suggests is important, is how do you avoid uh, mission creep within the use of these or the, their indiscriminate use? Uh, in the future, not necessarily happening uh, right now. And, and I guess, uh, I, I mean, you know, you, if you begin with a drone and see it as something that helps the soldier on the ground see on the other side of the hill and so on, mm -hmm. it, it makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, I guess 
this is all happening in the context of the adversary changing, you know, which is something that we right. talked about before. And uh, so that enters into the mix. So suddenly you have a device, or, or we've transitioned into to using the device a, as a manhunting uh, vehicle, mm -hmm. identifying uh, 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 targets that uh, uh, the evidence seemed to indicate poses a threat, you know, to the homeland right. or right. Uh, uh, might lead to a terrorist. T talk a little about that. I, I guess what people worry about, if I can speak for them, is kind of the inertial processes of, well, we've got this, first we'll use it for this and then that, you know, leading to a lack of uh, moral accountability. And, and I'm not necessarily talking about the military leaders. You know, I think more importantly, it's the political leaders. I, I, I understand and, uh, and, you know, again, these are legitimate concerns. But I can tell you as, a, as an operator of, of the systems and one who has uh, crafted rules of engagement for others who do the same thing, that, that the issue really is less about the means of delivering uh, uh, some armament or what have you against a target. The, the issue is the legitimacy of the target. It doesn't matter. I, I don't see the difference, frankly, between an F-16 delivering a 2,000-pound weapon on a target versus a Reaper or a Predator with a Hellfire missile. The, the real question is, is the target legitimate? That is absolutely appropriate. And I, you know, in my experience, the, our ability to surveil for days on end uh, has improved our uh, capacity to discriminate to have some measure of certainty that, that the target we are observing is in fact the, meets the criteria for, for engaging uh, the enemy. Um, and and that, that has been the case. I mean, mistakes occur. I'm not saying we're perfect by any means, but, but the key thing here is, is the target legitimate? And if it is, then, you know, it, 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 if it's a combatant, and there's a threat, and the legal processes have been followed which authorize the use of military force, then I personally have no inhibitions about engaging America's enemies at a distance. I think it is far preferable than, than meeting them in New York City or Washington, D.C. or elsewhere. Now, you may argue that that is sort of hyperbole, but but it is truly what I believe. And, but, but importantly, can we make a distinction between operational legitimacy? That is, <clears throat> this is a legitimate target based on what is a, a legitimate adversary, mm -hmm. but that is really determined by the political leadership, right? Isn't it? I mean... It, 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 in the end, uh, you know, the, the, the use of lethal force is... is circumscribed by statute, Title 10 and, and appropriate declarations by the Congress for the use of, of military force. And that is, that, that is executed by the executive in, it, in, it, in, in a legal process that's quite extensive, actually. And even their commanders in the field have... Uh, you know, judge advocates who advise them on the law of war. Remember, there, there are four basic criteria. One is necessity. You actually have to do this. There's a need. The second is proportionality, that you, the action you're taking is achieving a military objective that's not disproportionate to the threat. The other is humanity. You're doing it in a way that, that limits the... The, the adverse consequences of, of the engagement. Um, and so, you know, these are well-accepted principles of the law of war and, in my experience, something that the American Armed Forces practice professionally and with rigor. 
let's touch on another topic which which you have been in the middle of and which whoever replaces you will be in and that is the whole problem of austerity mm -hmm. and cutbacks in the defense budget you know the the primary target often is uh, 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 aircraft uh, and the commitment long term to building aircraft uh, and of course the secondary target is increasingly going to be the welfare system with, within the military and both of these are important to whoever is uh, chief of, of staff of the Air Force. Sure. Or, or, uh, I'm sure you've thought about this and, and what, what, what do you see as important in, in making uh, this, these cuts in a way that discriminates and maybe sequestration is just the wrong way to go. Uh, uh, it's just for forcing a situation where people like you and people who who succeed you are going to really have to say no, not indiscriminate, but no. this, we should use these standards. I think that uh, it is time for all of us in the defense sector, in in business sector, in the private sector, and average taxpayers to recognize you got to pay your bills. And trillion dollar deficits are clearly unsustainable. And so in my view, there is a need for uh, cost consciousness, there is a need for better management, there is a need for reducing expenditures in the defense sector. And that means the Air Force too. Now the dilemma that the Navy and the Air Force have and to, to a lesser extent, the Army and the Marines, is that, that the Air Force and the Navy are, that, that the, their basic inventory is in long-term, high-cost capital assets. Whereas in the Marines and the Army, they are far more human capital-based than, than is the case in the Navy and the Air Force. And so, Making reductions in this sort of an environment, in my view, suggests, and this has been the Air Force strategy, was to get smaller in order to maintain quality. I believe that remains the right strategy for all the services. Now, there are political forces which find that not very palatable. It's, it's, in, it's jobs, it's employment, it's installations, it's, it's uh, contribution to local economies and so on and so forth. But fundamentally, there, what, what the department needs to be able to do is to intelligently squeeze the force down so, so that the amount of money that's available will maintain the quality and the readiness of the remaining forces so that they can respond to contingencies. You know, we don't want a fair fight, ever. And the idea here is to make sure that we can, we can roll out our, our means and, and do what's necessary in a, again, a proportionate and, and humane way and, and come home. I think that, that the motivation will be, again, to get smaller and, and to maintain quality. And that suggests that the political leadership will, will have to concede on their, their temptation to suggest, take the cut somewhere else, you know, in somebody else's district rather than in mine. And, and so what you're suggesting is that you can plan your way through this Absolutely. within the Pentagon, but, but uh, where the, the tire hits the road is in sort of the loss of jobs, the closing of bases, or whatever is involved, where there has ceased to be a rationality for uh, development of particular weapon systems. Yeah, I think that uh, we, the, the department needs to make its case. I mean, in the end, it is by the Constitution, the Congress raises and sustains an army. And that's the way it is. And so the department and its both military and civilian leadership must make the case to Capitol Hill in a convincing way. But, but the folks there also need to understand that, that reductions are the only way 
getting smaller, maintaining quality, having modern systems, having a modernization program is, is the only way to maintain the, the excellence of the American armed forces over the longer term. And if, and if we continue to, to place dollars where they give us less return on investment, no business in America would be satisfied with that, and nor should DOD. Well, one final question, uh, looking back on your career, how would you advise students who are interested in the military to prepare for a future in which the strategic landscape may be entirely different than it was uh, uh, when you started? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely true. First of all, I, I, you know, my generation doesn't have near the talent or the, the awareness that, that this current generation does. Um, you know, we, we were pretty mechanical people. In, in those days, I must say, you know, set set pace people. Um, this is an adaptable generation. They are brighter, and they are certainly are better informed than we ever were. And so, the key thing, in my view, though, is patience. We've been through these cycles before; these boom and bust cycles. You and I have lived through them. We know we come out the other side, and 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 we'll be okay. We'll be different but we'll be okay and we're still going to be the best Air Force, Navy, or Army, or Marine Corps on the planet. So I think the key thing is to have patience, to trust, and, and to recognize that while the opportunities in the near term may be somewhat limit, more limited than they were during the, the last 10 years, to be sure, because of abundant resources, that America needs good people to do this stuff, and that their their patience will be rewarded both with a meaningful career, a safety net that will care for their families, and leadership that they can believe in. Well, on that note, uh, General Schwartz, I will thank you very much for being uh, on our program today. I, thank you, sir. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.